Pleasure, Dunnigan. I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to help the audience see what is being hidden from them, really. One of the things that we get frequent questions on is, and it's very difficult to answer, is when do we expect a economic collapse? But one of the ways to look at that is to say, what happened in the last major economic collapse or the one that we came closest to a total collapse and that people look back to the 2008 situation that ended up with uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and other things um, almost completely caving in the whole system and now uh, quite recently there's been some reports such as from the uh, IMF saying we have like at least nine banks that are posing systemic risk and that sort of thing so if you could at first at least give us a, an understanding of compared to 2008 are we better off worse off and if worse off how much worse and in what ways well i'll tell you you know to start with that is you know i definitely go by technical data and i have to say that prior to 2008 in july the previous uh july of 2007 actually the dollar fell to its lowest level against the standard weighted basket of currencies. To be perfectly honest with you, I didn't know exactly what that was going to exactly look at, look like, though prior to that, there was definitely some technical indications of a top in the real estate market. So when you couple that with that, what I was saying was something nasty this way comes. Now it didn't become apparent until March of 2008 when Bear Stearns went out. And then again, when those two hedge funds went from like one was 6 billion, the other was 6.2 billion. And within 24 hours, they were at zero. And then of course the Lehman moment. So, you know, you're right. The timing is a little bit challenging, but really what happened during that period of time was that liquidity had dried up. And I actually do have, I'm sorry, I'm not quite as organized as I like to be. But in other words, people don't understand, you know, liquidity either. But liquidity is there's always, there's a buyer and a seller. There's two sides of the market. And we're actually seeing that in 2008, that dried up and that has only gotten worse. I like to use the VIX chart to give you a good indication and, and we'll um, set these up as JPEGs and give you the link to that. But you can see they started tracking, this is the uh, Treasury Volatility Index, and they started tracking that back in 2003. And this was just a little dash. So you knew if you woke up in the morning and you were going to buy a Treasury or sell a Treasury, you pretty much knew what you were going to get for it or what you'd have to pay for it. But in 2008, the system died. And you can see these dashes then became lines. And in 2013, those lines became extreme. I just pulled this graph a few minutes ago. So this is very, very current. And part of what we have to wonder is this is really the traders, the high frequency traders. That's not about creating liquidity in a market. That's about front running a market and picking up pennies. So we're counting on these guys not to make a mistake on the 10-year treasury market, which is the foundation of all of the markets. But, you know, you ask me when, uh, last week, every week I do a segment called Insider Trading, where I take a look at what the guys, the CEOs, the CFOs, uh, the boards of directors, so the guys at the top of every corporation, what are they doing for themselves? Because I really always think that if you don't know anything else, but you know how to pay attention to what the guys at the top are doing, the smartest guys in the room on any given topic, then and you emulate them, you're more likely to be in the best position. So I, I can't really say 100% that this is an indicator simply because uh, we get this data from the Wall Street Journal, but it's a reasonably new data set that we're tracking. Having said that, I'd like you to take a look. These are insiders buying and selling. Now, what this means is for every $1 worth of buying that a guy at the top would do, maybe they have stock options and they're vested, et cetera, 
that they're selling. And you can see if the bar goes up, they're selling more than they're buying. If the bar goes down, they're buying more than they're selling. And you can see that clearly they've been selling far more than they've been buying. And then right before earnings season, that spiked. And so for every $1 worth of buying, let me just look at this quickly. Yeah. So by the time it got to this red bar, for every dollar's worth of buying was roughly $59 worth of selling. And then it jumped for every dollar's worth of buying to over $200 worth of selling. You can see that that collapsed the next week. There were still more selling than buying, but this would have been front loaded in there. So that would make some sense. And look at this, we've got another spike. Now I'll be doing this again tomorrow. But the point is, is that I look for patterns and I look for when patterns change because when that happens, it indicates that this trend is escalating. And I'm going to tell you, this is definitely something to pay attention to because it could certainly indicate that the insiders, while they were certainly increasing their selling by quite a lot, this looks like a possible panic to me. Can you see that okay? Sure. The one thing that's a little confusing is we're seeing a large uh, numbers on top of each bar that doesn't seem to correlate to the, the multiple that you were referring to. They all just say 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Is that like the number of sellers or what is that? Yes, and I'm glad, I'm glad that you brought that up because the Wall Street Journal tracks 10 sectors. Okay. okay. And so normally what this means is that all 10 sec sectors bought and all 10 sectors sold until you got here where you only had six sectors that bought and four that did not. Okay. And then you had nine sectors that bought and one that did not. Here, it was equally divided. So five sectors bought, but five sectors did not buy. And that's another shift in the pattern. So I'm glad you brought that up. Here, there were three sectors that did not buy. And last week, there were four sectors that did not buy. So between this pattern shift and the lack of buying, whole sectors not buying, this looks like a probable shift to me. And I would say the same thing that I said back in 2007, which is something nasty, this way comes. Because, you know, you, you asked me to look at the debt. What did I do? Here's all of the debt. So, you know, there are a lot of things that are different between, you know, 2008 and now. I pulled, it doesn't really matter what they are so much, but I pulled these from the Federal Reserve. And we can see, and they're all dated the same. So here's 2008 is right in here, okay? So what's happened in all of these areas, so student loans, global debt, uh, credit card debt, let's see, rest of the world debt, gross federal debt, state and local debt, motor vehicles debt, okay? They're all up significantly from 2008, okay? But what you're seeing in every single case is a huge escalation of debt. So when they talk about economic stimulation, well, all of that debt makes the stock markets look good. Look at this is just current from um, margin debt, which is borrowing to buy stocks. Now look at this pattern. This graph goes back to 95. And so you can see that margin debt and the stock market move were pretty coincidental until you got here, which is 3-1-2000, okay? And then it was still right, co they were absolutely correlated until 2003. And then they started that division. Okay, so can you see it? We're now at yes. the highest level of margin debt, frankly, since we were uh, back in 29. That's what's pushing these, uh, one of the things that's pushing the stock market up. Also, you've got the central bank balance sheet. That's the orange line is the central bank balance sheet. The blue line is the uh, stock market, the S&P 500. Those are pretty well correlated, aren't they? And this so, central bank balance sheet means that's a debt level, not not an asset, not a absolutely uh, okay. debt level. 
Yeah, that's all the new money printing. That's all debt. And you see, part of what people don't understand is that when a government issues debt, you and I are responsible to repay that debt. So when the central banks issue all of that new debt and print all that new money, you and I as taxpayers are responsible to pay that. And we can look at Puerto Rico and what happened to them. They were so heavily indebted, almost doubled their debt between 2006 and 2017. But none of that debt went to fixing the infrastructure. So when the, when the crisis hit, the hurricane hit, they're absolutely devastated and they have no savings and nobody will loan them money and they're still without power. So we're no different. One of the big gorillas in the room is now the central banks globally here, we've supposedly already begun. Well, I just pulled two graphs. From the, Fred, uh, from the Federal Reserve on this, so you can tell me if that's true. But all of this new debt that the central banks have been taking on, if everything is so wonderful, why did they add, what was it, 1 point or 15.1 trillion? They've added a trillion and a half more than that just since the first part of this year. But they're trying to tell us that everything is so good and growth is so good and well, you know, and now they're going to try and unwind this balance sheet. Historically, the balance sheet has never been this big. So they have no idea. That was a big experiment. Just a quick, quick, quick check for those of us, uh, of our listeners who are trying to understand when you talk about unwinding the balance sheet. Gregory Manorino has been on. He's talked about the, and you just talked about the central bank and the Fed buying up uh, both real estate, uh, underperforming, you know, asset and uh, also the stock market itself. So when that's in order to prop up and to juice the economy. But when they say unwind the balance sheet, just for common people, that means they're going to try to sell off uh, assets yes. that they had been purchasing up to prop up the economy? Exactly. Because the economy exactly. is healthy enough to go on without life support, that's the idea? Uh, well, that's what they want us to believe. Right, right. Okay, I mean, it's not true. You just looked at all those correlations, and this happens to be the, uh, let's see, I think this is the mortgage-backed securities. Yeah, these are the mortgage-backed securities, which they never even bought until 2009. A mortgage-backed security is a derivative. So what they're talking about doing, I mean, they've been buying 30% of the new issue in that market. So now they're going to stop buying that just from the runoff, right? You can see where they were adding to. And then they've just been, uh, whenever they have principal or interest, just reinvesting that. So it kind of looks flat. Now they're talking about selling this off. Well, let's see. If they're buying 30% of the market, who's going to step in to buy? And what happens to the interest rates when they sell? This is the one on the, oops, upside down, sorry. This is the one on the treasuries, right? So this is the government buying the um, new debt issued, or this is the Fed buying the new debt issued by the treasury. They're buying 18% of this market just again from the return of principal and interest and just reinvesting that into more treasuries. So who's going to pick up buying this when they stop? And they're raising interest rates. So that means all of this debt, all of it, you know, we've gotten shorter and shorter and shorter term with our debt, which means it rolls over more. And it's rolling over into a higher level interest rate environment. This is an accident waiting to happen and, and I'll tell you, Dunn, again, it was kind of interesting. I've been saying for a while, uh, and others have as well, that we're now in the melt-up mode of the markets. You talked about the banks. Well, you know, they do the stress tests on the banks. So I pay a very uh, close attention to the leverage ratio in those stress tests. And so the one that they did in June, Morgan Stanley in this country was the uh, had a had a uh, leverage ratio of three point five seven percent. 
Now you hear that, and frankly, does that sound bad to you? Leverage ratio, 3.57%. Okay, kind of low. But what that actually means is that they have borrowed almost 97% to get that 3% worth of equity, 3.57 to be specific, according to the feds. 3.57% in equity, the rest is all debt. So if their assets, stocks, bonds, real estate, derivatives, intellectual property, any of that stuff, if that falls 3.58%, their equity is gone. They are insolvent. And they are all incestuously intertwined. So it doesn't matter where this starts, it's going to go right through the entire system. And Deutsche Bank is, uh, I think they're at 3.58%, a little bit more. So yes, these markets are in melt-up mode because the central banks cannot afford for them to drop more than 4%. That alone would trigger a huge um, crisis throughout the whole markets because there would be margin calls and these banks would start falling like dominoes and it would become apparent, which is ultimately what's going to happen anyway. And it could very well be what that signal is because in all of my studies, what I've always seen is prior to a, a major market correction, the insiders get out and that's clearly what I'm seeing in here. So everybody else, they look on, you'll have to forgive me on this one. This one I really don't understand. <laughs> Pretty much every day, you could open up a paper and some bank is paying some fine for some manipulation of some one area or two or 10 areas of the markets. And yet somehow, if you look on TV or you look on the Internet and Wall Street tells you, well, stocks are worth this and gold is worth that and Bitcoin is worth this. Magically, people go, oh, well, oh, that must be true. Can you explain that one to me? Because I don't get that one. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. One of the things I think people a lot of people are subject to is uh sincerely wanting to do the right thing for their family and trying to position themselves yes. in a place that's going to benefit their family. They don't want to lose ground and they don't want to just tread water. They want to try to get ahead for their family. That that's that's right and proper. And when we're on the when you are being bombarded on the popular media with uh Dow making a new high, a new high, another record high, another record high without the perspective of saying, guys, you are riding on the surface of a balloon that's overinflated and squeaking and about ready to pop, uh, all people can see is, if I don't get in on this, I'm missing out because I just missed out on whatever 50% last year and 20% this quarter and on and on. And that's eerily like what was happening in the dot-com bubble right before that, you know, with the NASDAQ went up 97% or something the year before it, 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 it took a tumble. Uh, but But people seeing these official reasonable looking reporters on the, on and anchor people on the on the evening news talking about the the growth and the unstoppable dow and how how things could keep moving it's interesting because at the same time you're telling us is actually this is by necessity these this has to keep growing oh. because otherwise uh it's it's sudden death to to our entire system it it's understandable even if people have a gut feeling that gives them great pause about that they still feel well but that's the name of the game right now and I still got to take care of trying to get ahead for my family so there's a there's a very human temptation to try to ride that wave uh, and and think maybe maybe I can come out ahead before before it collapses you reminded right. us that, well, that that temptation good luck with that. yeah <laughs> I mean, because I watch it all the time, and I'll tell you the truth. My alma mater was Shearson, and so I paid a lot of attention to Shearson through 2007, 2008, and even I didn't know the day before it went out. And the problem is, is that there's no liquidity in these markets. 
And um, I, I know well, I yeah, that was the other point you're making: is that the Fed's showing up to to mop up and to provide the illusion of liquidity. Yes, exactly, the illusion of a liquidity. This is a graph. Uh, this first one is from uh, the Financial Times, but this is liquidity in the government bond market. It's down 70%. And this, you asked me what was the difference at this peak here. This is um, interbank lending. In other words, you can see that from the 70s, it was a rise up and banks would trust each other and loan to each other. Look at, I pulled this right before this. Look at where it is now. It's lower than it was when we were first kicking this off. These are the banks that are supposed to create that floor in the market so that when the bottom drops out, they go in and buy to support the market. They're not there. They're not there in stocks. They're not there in bonds. This is uh, Merrill Lynch's liquidity index. The index is dropping down, so that means there are no buyers on the other side while the stock market rages on. People think there's, they're liquid until a lot of people want to sell at once. And then guess what? It's not going to happen. And you're not going to be smarter than the feds or than the guys that control and manipulate these things. This can continue until it gets too expensive for them or they get tired of it. For or I shouldn't say get tired of it. I should say really more. They're ready for the next phase. And, and what they're doing right now is trying to drive everybody into digital currencies. Because once everything is in cyberspace, then central banks have full control. And they talk about it all the time. This was a, a report that just came out from a meeting that they did. And I know this is little, but this is from a, a report from the uh, first of this month. And they say... Uh, a central bank digital currency could allow the central bank to lower interest rates well into negative territory. In other words, if they want you to spend and you're not spending, well, if they start to eat up your principal, you might decide to go out and spend that money before the principal just evolves. And this is that uh, monetary velocity graph. So that is the number of times that money changes hands. And you can see that, I mean, here we are, let's see, where's 2008? Here's 2008 up here. This is where we are. What changed? Well, people don't have the money to, to, to spend because this is the purchasing power, right? That, since 2008, here we are in 2008, and here we are now. So the people don't have the money to spend, so they're not spending it. Nobody trusts really what's happening in here, but I am noticing a possible, a possible upturn here. There is a bit of a shift. I've got to pay attention and see how it evolves more, but this too, I just pulled, you know, before we started this interview. So this is very, very current. And this is the number of times people uh, money changes hands, and it changes hands when there's really confidence in the system. And I know they keep reporting consumer confidence is like a hundred million or you know some ridiculous number. Well, this tells a different story. So they may go ask somebody, "How confident are you?" But this shows me whether or not they're actually confident in what's happening, and this tells me a big fat no. You just a mentioned something a minute ago about velocity, not, not velocity, like this. you talked about uh, electronic currency and negative interest rates, and the language often obscures the the hit before, you know, you, afterwards you wake up and you, and you get educated on what the things mean, you go, ooh, that, I really got a punch to the gut back there, and I didn't even realize it because the way it was put. So when they talked about electronic central bank controlled currency will allow them to con give interest rates well into negative territory. What I hear you saying is, if all of your money is in the system, and you can't withdraw it into uh, tangible currency, then you you have to leave it in there. And when you do, if they drive negative interest rates, what that means is they're charging you, they're scalping money off of your savings, 
as as in has a hidden tax or hidden fees. They're basically taking money directly out of your account. But not so hidden. Okay. See, here's the challenge. First of all, I know this isn't long term, but basically the central bank, the Federal Reserve, has already taken 96, 98 percent of the purchasing power out of the dollar. So there's basically almost no purchasing power left. And that means that they have to start attacking principal. And that's actually what the um, negative interest rates are about, because they want you to spend money. And you see right now, if the central bank makes a policy choice, it takes 18 months working through the system to see the result and whether or not they got what they wanted. So first of all, I really seriously question if they really wanted the economy to be stimulated because they could have made a whole bunch of different choices that would have uh, worked better. However, so what they're seeing here, because this is their data, it's not mine, it's theirs, is that people aren't spending money. Now, let's say you have a thousand bucks in your account and you open your account tomorrow and 900 of it there's only 900 of it left. So $100 just disappeared through um, interest fees. And the next day you open it up and there's 800, right? Well, guess what? They can push those interest rates and erode your principal and they want to do it. Inflation is about doing it invisibly. Negative rates and what they're talking about is about doing it visibly because that's a button push and then you will see people start to spend money. When this graph starts to go up, you can rest assured that it, hyperinflation is on its way. And, and, and the other part of that, and we're in earnings seasons and they're talking about, you know, some of the corporations making all sorts of earnings and all of that. Well, in the beginning, inflation looks like growth, right? Mm -hmm. Because if they can force you to spend more money on that banana, I mean, you could live without a blouse, but you got to have a banana. So if they can create that inflation and force you to spend more on necessities, you can start to see this thing go up. But the fact that they think that they can control it when everything they're doing is an experiment, they have no idea. So they need a system that's trustless because they know that when this next crisis hits, that's it. The trust is so far down, according to Pew, um, that does all of the um, oh, research you know, studies, do all yeah. of the, surveys. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. It's end of the day. I'm a little tired. Um, so the confidence evaporates, and so this uh, the digital currencies gives them a lot more immediately immediate control. So they want you to spend money, they start taking away your principal and they look to see, are you spending money? Oh, you're not spending money? Okay, we'll push the rate more negative. We'll take more of your principal. Oh, you're still not spending money? And they can just keep eroding your principal with you seeing it and inspire you to spend, which by the way is hyperinflation, whether it's a deflationary hyperinflation or a hyperinflation hyperinflation. Another question related to that is, um People want to know, okay, if they become convinced that the stock market is riding on this bubble of debt inflation that's been pumped into it, then they say, okay, I don't want to participate in that. I want to protect my family's nest egg. So if you could just kind of, you've already covered a few topics, but if there's commonly understood options and alternatives that people have are things like, well, I'll go put my money into a, into a, a certificate of deposit, or I'll move my money into a money market account, or I'll move my money into a savings account, or I'll move my money into uh, insurance uh, product of some sort. Can you just quickly kind of touch on all these and say, listen, you may think you're safer here, or you think you're safer there, or you think you're safer there, but here's what's really happening in all those areas. You know, I usually like to say... What if I'm right and what if I'm wrong? All of those areas, if you cannot hold it in your hand, it is contract-based, okay? And any contract runs counterparty risk. So there are a few different risks. If you put your, your wealth in the bank, whether it's a CD or a savings account or a checking account, that's going to get bailed in because these banks are insolvent. 
and especially with all the derivatives and the debts that they have um, on there. I talked about the leverage ratio, but that doesn't even cover the debt. So, and, and we've been taught that having a stocks and bonds and oh, mutual funds, this is all diversified. No, it's all based on this, which is your purchasing power, the value of the dollar. So if what you hold is created from dollars and can only pay you back in dollars, when the dollar goes to zero, so do they. So you're, you're running a couple of risks. If you're right, it happens at this speed. If you're wrong, it happens overnight. So either way, this has been happening since 1913. It's not going to stop. Listen to them. They keep saying, we need more inflation. Um, today, this is, this is what I took delivery of today, okay? This is truly outside of the system, decentralized and real. These are just some gold Swiss francs, and I also bought some, some um, silver rounds, okay? In my hand, it is real, and here's the thing that people also don't understand. This has utility. It's used across the entire global system. The derivatives, the dollars, the stocks, the bonds, it's used in one place. Those stocks, bonds, anything that's made out of dollars or fiat money, those 100% of the time, historically, they go to zero, zero. But there's always demand for this. So what that it's in this form? They can melt this down. They can turn it into wire if they need to. They can melt this down. They can put it in your tooth or do anything else that they want. But this is utility. Full. That's why this has intrinsic value. So, you know, for those, my mantra, which is why I feel so close to you, really, is food, water, energy, security. This is just the barterable uh, part of my portfolio, but barterability and wealth preservation. And I do that with larger gold coins. I'm sorry, I don't have any here to show you. But um, if you really want to protect your family, make sure you've got food, water, energy, security. And, you know, I think this was maybe 17 bucks, 18 bucks. I think this was maybe 300 bucks. So, you know, we have a we have a minimum of 500 bucks because we think everybody needs to be protected. But you should also know anything that's physical. Well, this is this is just costume. But, you know, any of this gold that's real, no matter what the form is, it's monetary at its base. So and it doesn't matter what condition it's in. It can be broken. It can be bent and tarnished. So maybe you have anything that's marked sterling silver is 92.5% pure. Maybe you have Aunt Bessie's salt and pepper shakers, you know, or, or flatware. So, yeah, you're not diversified and you're not, doing, you're not doing yourself a favor if you're sitting in fiat money products. Personally, I have cash because that's our first line of defense, but I only have a certain minimum of cash for me. I'm all in, and and I just told you where I hold my wealth. Or all out, depending on which <laughs> way people are are uh, are looking at it. Um, for for those people who, and it's quite common for people to have a significant, uh, like four hundred one ks or IRAs that are yeah. tied up in the system. With our aging demographics of the baby boomer generation, you mentioned if the if the Fed says they're going to start trying to unwind their balance sheet, you say who's going to be the buyers? You mentioned if the banks. Uh, if anything even uh, re went reverse on them by a few percent would find themselves insolvent. What about the whole generation of baby boomers that are now kind of riding this, the, the, this kind of the, the final crest of this of this demographic wave and have been having all their assets tied up in 401ks and IRAs and now are about to get to the age where they can start withdrawing on that? Uh, do you do you know any tips for people who don't want to wait to be, uh, I see one of our recent guests said, don't be the third person in line, you know, trying to get your money out. <laughs> so Exactly. 
Um, you know, for me personally, when we hit the final phase of the currency's life cycle, I took a distribution of my SEP IRA, and at that time, I even had to pay the 10% penalty. And you need to understand that the reason why they set these things up the way they do is, uh, you know, let's say you've got 100, just to make life easy, you've got 100 grand in a 401k. You know, well, if you got $1,000 and you paid 300 bucks on that for, you know, taxes, you wouldn't like it. But uh, it's 300 bucks. If, however, you now have to pay 30,000 bucks or 40,000 bucks, you go, oh, I, I don't want to pay that. I, but that's perception management again, because you're always going to have to pay taxes. So there's a couple of choices. Uh, and not everybody will have these choices. If you're a baby boomer, you probably do, where you can take a distribution pay your taxes, and because this is so severely undervalued that you can recoup it. That's called buying low and selling high. Um, I think I just crunched the numbers today, and we're somewhere on the true value of an ounce of gold is somewhere north of 9500 bucks, and on the silver, I think it was like 627 you know, conservatively. So since you're buying this for, you know, 17 18 bucks. And it's actually really its true value is like 637. I'm hoping that you can see how you can recoup those taxes or any fees or, or anything like that. But for those of you that cannot or choose not to take a distribution, then um, this isn't really the right type of goal to do it. But you need a certain level of gold so that if that retirement plan goes away, then then the gold, again, because of that fundamental value piece, will recoup those losses. So, you know, for me, I like, I like to hold my wealth in my hands. It's real. It's tangible. I have choices, and I'm in control of it. I'm not in control of the spot market, but I am in control of what I do with the real stuff. Um, and I don't hold any stocks or bonds or 401ks or CDs or annuities or savings. Uh, I do have a savings account, but I hold the savings account, even my cash. I don't leave it in the bank. You know, I have all of that, but it's under my control because they're not paying you to take the risks that you're running. And it's just your perception that that bank is safe, that the FDIC insurance is there. Well, it's there, but they've got a penny to insure every dollar, and if you're over that limit, that 250 max, no insurance at all. And frankly, 2008, they were, according to the FDIC, they were one depository institution going out from where it would have become apparent to everybody that the system was a scam. They did not have the money to bail even one more takeover, one more failing institution. So they did some things and, and that wasn't an, you know, and they kind of bailed themselves out, charged higher fees, the government injected some capital, whatever, but they were one institution away, according to them, for uh, actually making that visible. Well, Lynette, uh, you've been generous with your time once again, and there's so many aspects to this that we do not and are not hearing on the mainstream media. All we hear about is these record high markets and how, how the economy seems to be turning around and we're having better employment and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, but Dunnigan, this morning, they talked about that we were in melt-up mode, not saying it in a negative way, but they were... You know, if you listen to them, they do talk out of both sides of their mouths because on one hand, they'll, they'll admit that this is a central bank led rally and all of the debt and all of that. And the next the next side of their mouth, they're talking about, you know, how great this is a bull market. It has so much more to run. But they're even saying that we're in melt up mode. If we're in melt up mode, I'm not saying it can't last longer, but I'm saying that they know that there's a crash that's coming. And, you know, I'm going to go back to this, you know, where look at this pattern shift. This shift matters. It matters. I'm telling you, something nasty this way comes. In the spring of 2008, my mom told me that some of the elderly people in a 
a support group that she attended were saying amongst themselves and to her that something was uh, going to be very different about the fall of 2008 and anybody who wanted to uh, take care of themselves should should protect themselves and get out of the market. And I thought, well, my mom doesn't have that much money and the people she knows probably don't have that much money so that they probably don't have very good advice if they don't have a lot of money. So I just let it go by and we paid a significant price that our, our viewers have heard about with the our uh, money market reserve fund uh, being being yes. collaterally damaged by Lehman Brothers and our money being tied up for, for years and us never getting it all back. So I'm particular, we're particularly sensitive to that idea that you may make your move quote unquote too early, but it's you won't have a move to make if you, if you wait till it's too late. So exactly, I, I like to say I'd rather be two weeks too early than one second too late because we won't have any choices. You mentioned some people may not have the option of withdrawing their four hundred one k. Is that is that ac actually the case? I think it may be for some some of the ways things are written if for, you're for employees. Yeah, right. It you know, there are a few things. It kind of depends on how the documents are written. Um, and, and also, if you're currently still employed there and currently still contributing, that may not be an option. You might have the op market, the S&P 500. Those are pretty well correlated, aren't they? And this so, central bank balance sheet means that's a debt level, not, not an asset, not a... Absolutely, uh, okay. debt level. Yeah, that's all the new money printing. That's all debt. And you see, part of what people don't understand is that when a government issues debt, you and I are responsible to repay that debt. So when the central banks issue all of that new debt and print all that new money, you and I as taxpayers are responsible to pay that. And we can look at Puerto Rico and what happened to them. They were so heavily indebted, almost doubled their debt between 2006 and 2017. But none of that debt went to fixing the infrastructure. So when the, when the crisis hit, the hurricane hit, they're absolutely devastated and they have no savings and nobody will loan them money and they're still without power. So we're no different one of the big gorillas in the room is now the central banks globally here, we've supposedly already begun. Well, I just pulled two graphs from the Fred, uh, from the Federal Reserve on this, so you can tell me if that's true. But all of this new debt that the central banks have been taking on, if everything is so wonderful, why did they add, what was it, one point or 15.1 trillion? They've added a trillion and a half more than that just since the first part of this year. But they're trying to tell us that everything is so good and growth is so good. And well, you know, and now they're going to try and unwind this balance sheet. Historically, the balance sheet has never been this big. So they have no idea that was a big experiment just a quick quick, quick check for those of us uh of our listeners who are trying to understand when you talk about unwinding the balance sheet gregory manorino has been on he's talked about the and you just talked about the central bank and the fed buying up uh both real estate uh, underperforming you know assets and uh also the stock market itself so when that's in order to prop up and to juice the economy but when they say unwind the balance sheet just for common people that means they're going to try to sell off uh, assets yes. that they had been purchasing up to prop up the economy? Exactly. Because the exactly. economy is healthy enough to go on without life support, that's the idea? Uh, well, that's what they want us to believe. Right, right. Okay. I mean, I, it's not true. You just looked at all those correlations, and this happens to be the, uh, let's see, I think this is the mortgage-backed securities. Yeah. These are the mortgage-backed securities, which they never even bought until 2009, a mortgage-backed security is a derivative. So what they're talking about doing, I mean, they've been buying 30% of the new issue in that market. So now they're gonna stop buying that just from the runoff, right? You can see where they were adding to, and then they've just been, uh, whenever they have principal or interest, just reinvesting that, so it kind of looks flat. Now they're talking about selling this off. Well, let's see, if they're buying 30% of the market, who's going to step in to buy? And what happens to the interest rates when they sell? This 
is the one on the, oops, upside down, sorry. This is the one on the treasuries, right? So this is the government buying the um, new debt issued, or this is the Fed buying the new debt issued by the treasury. They're buying 18% of this market just again from the return of principal and interest and just reinvesting that into more treasuries. So who's going to pick up buying this when they stop? And they're raising interest rates. So that means all of this debt, all of it, you know, we've gotten shorter and shorter and shorter term with our debt, which means it rolls over more and it's rolling over into a higher level interest rate environment. This is an accident waiting to happen. And, and I'll tell you, Dunn, again, it was kind of interesting. I've been saying for a while, uh, and others have as well, that we're now in the melt-up mode of the markets. You talked about the banks. Well, you know, they do the stress tests on the banks. So I pay a very uh, close attention to the leverage ratio in those stress tests. And so the one that they did in June, Morgan Stanley in this country was the uh, had a had a uh, leverage ratio of three point five seven percent. Now you hear that, and frankly, does that sound bad to you? Leverage ratio three point five seven percent. Okay, kind of low, but what that actually means is that they have borrowed almost ninety seven percent to get that 3% worth of equity, 3.57 to be specific, according to the feds. 3.57% in equity, the rest is all debt. So if their assets, stocks, bonds, real estate, derivatives, intellectual property, any of that stuff, if that falls 3.58%, their equity is gone they are insolvent and they are all incestuously intertwined. So it doesn't matter where this starts, it's going to go right through the entire system. And Deutsche Bank is, uh, I think they're at 3.58%, a little bit more. So yes, these markets are in melt-up mode because the central banks cannot afford for them to drop. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Is that like the number of sellers or what is that? Yes, and I'm glad I'm glad that you brought that up because the Wall Street Journal tracks 10 sectors, okay? okay. And so normally what this means is that all 10 sec sectors bought and all 10 sectors sold until you got here where you only had six sectors that bought and four that did not. Okay. And then you had nine sectors that bought and one that did not. Here, it was equally divided. So five sectors bought, but five sectors did not buy. And that's another shift in the pattern. So I'm glad you brought that up. Here, there were three sectors that did not buy. And last week, there were four sectors that did not buy. So between this pattern shift and the lack of buying whole sectors not buying, this looks like a probable shift to me. And I would say the same thing that I said back in 2007, which is something nasty, this way comes. Because, you know, you, you asked me to look at the debt. What did I do? Here's all of the debt. So, you know, there are a lot of things that are different between, you know, 2008 and now. I pulled, it doesn't really matter what they are so much, but I pulled these from the Federal Reserve. And we can see, and they're all dated the same. So here's 2008 is right in here, okay? So what's happened in all of these areas, so student loans, global debt, uh, credit card debt, let's see, rest of the world debt, gross federal debt, state and local debt, motor vehicle debt, okay, they're all up significantly from 2008. 
Okay, but what you're seeing in every single case is a huge escalation of debt. So when they talk about economic stimulation, well, all of that debt makes the stock markets look good. Look at this is just current from um, margin debt, which is borrowing to buy stocks. Now, look at this pattern. This graph goes back to 95. And so you can see that margin debt and the stock market move were pretty coincidental until you got here, which is 31,000. Okay. And then it was still right, co they were absolutely correlated until 2003. And then they started that division. Okay. So can you see it? We're now at yes. the highest level of margin debt, frankly, since we were uh, back in 29. That's what's pushing these, uh, one of the things that's pushing the stock market up. Also, you've got the central bank balance sheet. That's the orange line is the central bank balance sheet. The blue line is the uh, stock market. And in 2013, those lines became extreme. I just pulled this graph a few minutes ago. So this is very, very current. And part of what we have to wonder is this is really the traders, the high frequency traders. That's not about creating liquidity in a market. That's about front running a market and picking up pennies. So we're counting on these guys not to make a mistake on the 10 year treasury market, which is the foundation of all of the markets. But, you know, you ask me when. Uh, last week, every week I do a segment called Insider Trading, where I take a look at what the guys, the CEOs, the CFOs, uh, the boards of directors, so the guys at the top of every corporation, what are they doing for themselves? Because I really always think that if you don't know anything else, but you know how to pay attention to what the guys at the top are doing, the smartest guys in the room on any given topic, then and you emulate them, you're more likely to be in the best position. So I, I can't really say 100% that this is an indicator simply because uh, we get this data from the Wall Street Journal, but it's a reasonably new data set that we're tracking. Having said that, I'd like you to take a look. These are insiders buying and selling. Now, what this means is for every $1 worth of buying that a guy at the top would do, maybe they have stock options and they're vested, et cetera, that they're selling. And you can see if the bar goes up, they're selling more than they're buying. If the bar goes down, they're buying more than they're selling. And you can see that clearly they've been selling far more than they've been buying. And then right before earnings season, that spiked. And so for every $1 worth of buying, let me just look at this quickly. Yeah. So by the time it got to this red bar, for every dollar's worth of buying was roughly $59 worth of selling. And then it jumped for every dollar's worth of buying to over $200 worth of selling. You can see that that collapsed the next week. There were still more selling than buying, but this would have been front loaded in there. So that would make some sense. And look at this, we've got another spike. And I'll be doing this again tomorrow. But the point is, is that I look for patterns and I look for when patterns change, because when that happens, it indicates that this trend is escalating. And I'm going to tell you, this is definitely something to pay attention to because it could certainly indicate that the insiders, while they were certainly increasing their selling by quite a lot, this looks like a possible panic to me. Can you see that okay? Sure. The one thing that's a little confusing is we're seeing a large uh, numbers on top of each bar that doesn't seem to correlate to the, the multiple that you were referring to. They all just say, As you're done again, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to help the audience see what is being hidden from them, really. One of the things that we get frequent questions on is, and it's very difficult to answer, is when do we expect a economic collapse? But one of the ways to look at that is to say, what happened in the last major economic collapse or the one that we came closest to a total collapse and that people look back to the 2008 situation that ended up with uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and other things. Um, 
almost completely caving in the whole system. And now, uh, quite recently, there's been some reports such as from the uh, IMF saying we have like at least nine banks that are posing systemic risk and that sort of thing. So if you could at first at least give us a, an understanding of compared to 2008, are we better off, worse off, and if worse off, how much worse and in what ways? Well, I'll tell you, you know, to start with that is, you know, I definitely go by technical data. And I have to say that prior to 2008 in July, the previous uh, July of 2007, actually, the dollar fell to its lowest level against the standard weighted basket of currencies. To be perfectly honest with you, I didn't know exactly what that was going to exactly look at, look like, though prior to that, there was definitely some technical indications of a top in the real estate market. So when you couple that with that, what I was saying was something nasty this way comes. Now it didn't become apparent until March of 2008 when Bear Stearns went out. And then again, when those two hedge funds went from like one was 6 billion, the other was 6.2 billion. And within 24 hours, they were at zero. And then of course the Lehman moment. So, you know, you're right. The timing is a little bit challenging, but really what happened during that period of time was that liquidity had dried up. And I actually do have, I'm sorry, I'm not quite as organized as I like to be. But in other words, people don't understand, you know, liquidity either. But liquidity is there's always, there's a buyer and a seller. There's two sides of the market. And we're actually seeing that in 2008, that dried up and that has only gotten worse. I like to use the VIX chart to give you a good indication and, and we'll um, set these up as JPEGs and give you the link to that. But you can see they started tracking, this is the uh, Treasury Volatility Index, and they started tracking that back in 2003. And this was just a little dash. So you knew if you woke up in the morning and you were going to buy a treasury or sell a treasury, you pretty much knew what you were going to get for it or what you'd have to pay for it. But in 2008, the system died. And you can see these dashes then became lines.